It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. When you receive a copy of your Bible, you'll realize that the first five books are attributed to Moses. They include the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, the book of Numbers, and the book of Deuteronomy. However, is there any sort of truth to the case of a guy named Moses that actually exists? For today's episode, compared to mythology, we're going to get into more details about this particular issue. Within biblical scholarship, they use something that is known as the documenting hypothesis. The J source is the Yahweh source, the E source is the Elohim source, the pre source is the priestly source, and the D source is the Deuteronomy source. Now they roughly came out roughly around these sort of time periods. It came out roughly around like 922 BCE for one source, about 722 BCE for another source, about 539 BCE, and finally roughly around 400 BCE, give or take. The main reason why they use this hypothesis is because largely the scholars have noticed that there are various different writing styles within the exact same books or within the exact same paragraphs and they notice that the writing styles are different from chapter to page to page and chapter. Additionally, it's really hard to know who actually wrote these books down largely because the original manuscripts in Hebrew are actually anonymous writers, so we have no idea who actually wrote the first five books of the Bible. I mean, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, Moses dies, so there's no way in hell he actually wrote that book down if he actually dies in his own story. Now let's compare and contrast the birth stories between Moses and Sargon of Akkad. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levi woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, he hid him for three months. But when she hid him no longer, she got a basket for him and coated it with tar and pinch. Then she placed the child in it and put him among the reeds along the banks of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slaves to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. The legend of Sargon of Akkad came out roughly 300 BCE. Now, this is actually before the book of Exodus because the book of Exodus came out roughly around 1400 BCE. She sent me in a basket of rush of a butterman she sealed, my lid. She cast me in the river where she did not rose over me. The water bore up and carried me to Anki, the drawer of water. Anki, the drawer of water, let me out as he dipped his eater. Anki, the drawer of water, took me at his son and reared me. Not only does the Exodus story have clear cut influences from Sargon Makad, but it seems as though that there are direct passages that are very similar to Egyptian records and history. The Egyptian priest Mamito in the early 3rd century BCE wrote a history of Egypt in which he gave us two versions of an Exodus-like historical event. The following abstracts are from the Jewish historian Josephus. There was a king of ours whose name was Timus. Under him it came to pass, I know not how, that God was averse to us. And it came there, after a surprising matter, men of a noble birth came out of the eastern parts and had bonus enough to make an ambition into our country, and with ease subdued by force, yet are hazarding a battle with them. So when they have gotten those that govern us under their power, they afterward burn down our cities and demolish the temples of the gods and use all the inhabitants after a most barbarous matter. Nay, some they slew and led their children and their wives into slavery. These people, whom we had before named kings and called shepherds also, and their descendants kept possession of Egypt 511 years. And after these, he says that the kings of Tebas and other parts of Egypt made an insurrection against the serpents, and that there was a terrible and long war that was made between them, that under a king whose name is, I cannot even pronounce that name, the shepherds were subdued by him and were indeed driven out of the other parts of Egypt, but were shut up in a place that contained 10,000 acres. This place was called Averis. 
The serpent built a wall around this place, and after that, this commission was made. They went away with their whole families and effects, not fewer in number than 240,000, and took their journey from Egypt through the wilderness for Syria. But that they were in fear of the Assyrians, who had the domination over Asian Den, they built a city in that country that is now called Judea, and that large enough to contain this great number of men and call it Judaism. After those that were sent to work in the conjuries that had continued that miserable state for a long while, the king was desired that he would be set apart in the city of Aris, which was then desolated of the shepherds. He then in first place made this law for them, that they should neither worship the Egyptian gods, nor abstain from any of those sacred animals, which they have the high esteem, but to kill and destroy them all, that they should join themselves to no one, but to those who were of this confederacy. You guys are thinking what I'm thinking? Yes, that's right. That's basically the Ten Commandments right there. But for the people of Judaism, when they came down together from the polluted Egyptian, they treated the men in such a barbarous matters that those who saw how they subdued the aforementioned country and the horrific wickedness that they were guilty of uh, thought of it was the most dreadful thing. For they not only set the cities and villages on fire, but they were not satisfied until they had been guilty of wrongdoing, and destroyed the images of the gods, and used them in roasting those sac sacred animals that were used to be worshipped, and forced the priests and prophets to be the executors and murderers of those animals, and then injected them naked out the country. It's also reported that the priest who obtained their policy and their laws was birth of Helbalus, and his name Apuris from Osiris, who was the god there, but he went over to those people, his name was changed, and he was called Moses. Another thing that is just so crazy about this whole entire deal is the fact that for the Book of the Dead, they also have a set of Ten Commandments like the previous story I just read out loud. I honor virtue, I benefit with gratitude, I am peaceful, I respect the property of others, I affirm that life is sacred, I give offerings that are genuine, I live in truth, I regard all alter with respect, I speak with sincerity, I consume only my fair share, I offer words of good intent, I relate in peace, I honor animals with reverence. I can be trusted, I care for the earth, I keep my own counsel, I speak positively of others, I remain in balance of my emotions, I am trustful in my relationships, I hold purity and high esteem, I spread joy. I do the best I can, I communicate with compassion, I listen to opposing opinions, I celebrate harmony. Besides the Egyptian Book of the Dead, there are also direct parallels of other laws that were made in ancient Mesopotamia during that time period. For example, one such law is actually the Code of Mamu, which was written down roughly around 2100 to 2050 BCE. For example, it says, if a man commits a murder, then that man must be killed. If a man commits a robbery, he must be killed. If a man commits a kidnapping, he has to be in prison and pay 15 shekels of silver. If a slave marry a slave and that slave is set free, he does not leave the household. If a slave marries a native person, he or she is to hand the firstborn son to his owner. If a man violates the right of another and this fellow is a virgin while the young man, they shall kill that male. If the wife of the male follow after another man and he slept with her, they shall slay that woman, but that man shall be set free. Another example will be the Code of Urbarabi. Now the Code of Urbarabi was written down roughly around 755 to 750 BCE. If a man accuses another man and charges him of homicide, but cannot bring proof against him, his accuser shall be killed. If a man breaks into their house, they shall hang him in front of that very breach. If a merchant should give silver to a trading agent for an investment virtue, he, the trading agent, assure a loss on his journeys, he shall return silver to the merchant in the amount of the capital sum. If a man takes an adoption a young child at birth and then wears him, the wearing will not be reclaimed. If a man shall blind the eye of another man, they shall blind his eye. This idea for an eye for an eye 
is literally referenced in Exodus chapter 21, verse 24, where it says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot. To further solidify the points, that is actually a direct reference to the Kota of Arabi. In my last video, I mentioned how for the Tower of Babel, it was actually dedicated to the worship of Murdoch, and we also learned in the last video about the Tower of Babel that Murdoch was referenced in the Aluma Elish, and the Aluma Elish actually expired the book of Genesis. And so it turns out that this particular Kota of Arabi was also set up in the Babylonian temple of Murdoch. The question now becomes, do we actually have historical evidence to support the idea of a mass exodus? Now, according to the Exodus story, there was about 600,000 men on foot besides men and women. So what does the data show us? How can you explain the possibility of a, such a large group as described in the Exodus story actually going out of Egypt? Is that possible? Well, I couldn't explain it. <laughs> Nothing of that shows up in the archaeological or textual record. And uh, one might argue that's a, an argument from silence, admittedly. But nonetheless, uh, we know so much about that period that uh, not to find even a single blip on the radar screen, as it were, um, it, it would be fatal to that theory. Moreover, the biblical account <coughs> has uh, 600,000 weapon-bearing males leaving, uh, leaving Egypt in the Exodus. That would probably translate into two million souls. Um, can you imagine two million people leaving uh, a country of the size of Egypt, which had only a population of three and a half million at the time? That would have made a huge hole in the, in the social and economic system that certainly would have shown up in the records. It would have resulted almost immediately in a downsizing economically and uh, socially that would certainly have disrupted the empire uh, irreparably. Nothing of that sort is found in the record. Not a thing. I couldn't see the exodus as described in the Bible as occurring in the 13th century. Based upon this information, I can only conclude that the book of Exodus is historical fiction. There is no real way to actually confirm the events that actually took place in the Exodus, and it seems as though that we have no way to actually identify this Moses guy in the Bible, because it seems as though that the Moses character used elements of different characters in the surrounding cultures. Although something is historical fiction, it does not mean you cannot possibly enjoy a story for what it is, a story. And so I have no problem with saying that the Book of Exodus is actually one of my favorite stories out there. And that The Prince of Egypt is like one of my favorite films. But what do you guys think about this? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.